Welcome to Traverse, a Huckberry podcast with myself, Chris Burkhard, and Charles Post. Today's episode features the one and only Conrad Anchor, an alpinist who's best known for his lifelong pursuit of daring first ascents of climbing routes. Conrad led the North Face's climbing team for over two decades with a knack for expedition planning. He summited the world's highest peak without oxygen. He was on the team that found George Mallory's body on Everest, and he got the first ascent of the shark's fin on Meru after many other climbers had failed. But amongst those accolades, he's also a husband, father, and a deeply philosophical guy. And today, we get the honor and privilege to dive deep and learn from the legend himself. Charles, what's up, my man? Chris, how are you? I'm good, buddy. I'm good. I, uh, dude, I can't believe we're so close. It's so weird to me that like <laughs> you and I, West Coast or you know, West Coast kids, I guess you could say, um, even though we're we're scratching forty, um, are basically <laughs> uh, are basically you know both for some weird reason in the Arctic, and we're having this like you know these deep conversations you know in the middle of just seemingly nowhere. Uh, it's pretty rad. It's true. I mean, I was just thinking about that today. I think you're of my friends from California. I think you're the closest one to me at this moment. Yeah. Wild, man. Wow. Well, both of us are getting our fill of cod and Arctic char and all those good things and rain. Oh God. (laughs) Tons of rain, sleet, snow. And uh, we barely see that yellow thing in the sky these days, which has taken its toll a little bit, but today's rad because it's a little slice of home for both of us. You know, our, our guest Conrad Anchor is someone who's really close to you. For me, he's, he's a little more of like a of an idol, of a hero that I haven't had a chance to talk to as much. But um, <clears throat> his experience left such a deep impression on me in terms of just like you know climbing in Yosemite and growing up, going there, and 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 his lineage in this place. And I'll just be the first to say that our conversation sort of started with these like formalities, you know, like getting to know each other, and then it just dove so deep, so fast, and. You know, maybe you've experienced this before, but I was just so taken by his openness, by his willingness to share. You know, I mean, I could have talked to him for an hour just about simply living in old priest grade, but this is like such so much more than I could have ever imagined. You have somebody who's truly done it all. They've climbed the tallest peaks, they've done the gnarliest expeditions, they've been to the end of the earth, they've done the first. So many people in the adventure space with these with these kind of high intensity lives, take the fast lane and Conrad's going to take us in the, in the slow lane. He's going to take us through the more uh, mindful, intentional steps in life that can get you to those Epic places, but maybe in a Mm. different route, the scenic route, uh, if you will. He's kind of in some way managed to, to introspect, to reflect and, and sort of do what I love and what you love is, which is to find those kernels of truth, those pearls Mm -hmm. of wisdom, and then offer them. And, And so willingly, it's so rad. And, um, I have this kind of, uh, <laughs> this fascination. Uh, I felt very much like Wayne's world being like, we're not worthy. <laughs> we're not worthy. <laughs> kind of vibe. But, um, yeah, this was a good one and I'm really, really excited. So, um, our guest today is the one and only Conrad anchor. And today we get the honor and the privilege to, uh, to dive deep and learn, learn from the master himself. I'm Charles Post. And I'm Chris Burkhardt. Let's get to it. You grew up in a place that in your lifetime has been totally transformed by this new kind of world we're living in. I mean, Yosemite was your backyard. Nobody has that story. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, my father's side of the family is from Big Oak Flat, which is off of Highway 120. And so they, going back on my maternal grandmother's side, uh, the Corcoran side, so they showed up in 1853 with the big land heist from the Miwok Indians as the uh, the Europeans came in seeking gold and all the trappings that uh, extractive things have. And so that was the beginning of it. So um, in some circles, it's like, oh, you've been in California for a long time. But other times I'm like, yeah, people lived here before we we came there. But um, yeah, we would spend every summer in the uh, two weeks in the summer. Summer vacation was in the High Sierras, alternating between Highway 108, uh, Sonora Pass, and Highway 120, Tioga Pass, going north to south, kind of like the 
the uh, hard rock where they they change the direction every year. So we'd go from one freeway to the next or highway and get dropped off by my grandparents and then take mules and go through the backcountry. That was my start to it. So with, with Yosemite, you know, being where you grew up and then it shaped so much of your early career. I wonder as a young person, did you know that this place out the back door was kind of this diamond on earth, that this kind of rare you know, I mean, cathedral of stone, like, did that, did you, did you get, grasp that or was it just your backyard and it was just what you knew? So it wasn't extraordinary. Yeah, it was there. And we would go into Yosemite Valley to see the waterfalls. But as a kid, it was like, oh, there's too many people there. And this is in the sixties. <laughs> oh, <I'm just> <laughs> we'd go up into the high country. Oh. And, and then as I started rock climbing, I became really focused on the cliffs and, and everything. And Yosemite Valley is unique in that it's a, there's a four lane road going in there. It's got infrastructure. It always has had inhabitants uh, there um, going back to the Awanichi um, and then the settlers and they had a dairy farm, apple orchards, a lot of those things in there. So, but um, yeah, we mostly focused on the backcountry. Um, a lot of times starting out from Saddlebag Lake over on uh, Tioga Pass and then going over the crest of Sierras and then doing these trips. Maxwell Lake was an example of a place. And um, as a kid, climbing Amelia Earhart Peak was <laughs> out of Tuolumne Meadows. I remember that was a, a big deal. And of course, like when you're 12 years old, I was fascinated with all things mysterious, which included Bigfoot, UFOs, and the disappearance of Amelia Earhart and her plane. So I had to go, go climb that mountain. So that's but, awesome. Uh, yeah, the uh, the formative years, my dad and his uh, cohorts, they took me out. And it um, did more for the foundation of becoming an alpinist is those those early trips in the high country in the Sierras. And we uh, we had plastic see-through tarpaulins, though, that we would be like, we can see the stars. <laughs> and we'd pitch in between trees with rocks in the corners. And my mother and sisters would complain about the mosquitoes and <laughs> they were like, we didn't buy a tent. It was pretty rustic, cooking everything out of a billy tin, um, like a number 10 soup can with a coat hanger on it over a fire um, and a couple little cooking things, but catching fish every day for sustenance. And every now and then one of the, the mules would run away and we'd have to spend a day finding it or <laughs> you try to stake them out. And it's, it's interesting that uh, uh, livestock in the backcountry is still part of the national uh, park system and certainly national forest system. Conrad, was there like a significant experience that you feel kind of one of those peaks you climbed as a, as a kid or where you saw the potential for, obviously like you were there kind of pre Renaissance period of climbing. So, so was there, was there a significant moment where you saw somebody maybe like on the big stone or you saw somebody in the distance, you're like, wow, that looks really interesting. I want to do that. Was, I mean, how did, how did you leap from, from being a kid peak bagging, you know, and um, having that experience to all of a sudden being like, well, I want to ascend something vertical. Cause it's, it's such a leap and that that's so intriguing to me. Yeah. There was um, one pack trip that we went on and so you'd pack on the trail and this is when backpacking was a big thing. I mean, it's what people did. And now it's sort of like day use, walk 15 minutes from the car, buy a souvenir, ask someone, is that all? <laughs> and then depart. And so it's, it's very different. We would spend these two week trips in the back country and we'd go out there and we'd see things. And when you're on the trail, people would come by and you would have these conversations. And I remember at age oh, 14 that, uh, this fellow walked into camp by himself and he had like the coolest pack at the time was either a Kelty or a Jan sport. And <laughs> We had these old funky contraptions that had been handed down. I was like, wow, the guy's got all this stuff. And we got to a conversation and his goal was he was training to climb El Capitan in a day. And that was just like, whoa. So I had this this touch point with that. And then whether it was on that same trip or a, a, a different trip, but about the same age, there was this one moment where walking out of the mountains after being in there for a week or two and... It was one of those magical days that your pack packs itself, everything finds its spot, it feels lightweight, 
the the stream is 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 rushing and the smell of the pines is there and it was this moment like oh this is my happiest place whatever i do i need to focus on life so i can spend more time being outdoors and that was sort of this at a young age and um i was fortunate that i had um trust and encouragement from my parents and mentors that helped me along the way you know it's it's wild to me how how eloquently you describe these experiences and I, and i i you know i'm not i don't want to blow any you know smoke up your ass but like as a youth as a kid were, were your parents poetic in the way that they describe these things or is this just more a, a lifelong's reflection of these places these experiences because i i feel like I, I get to a loss for words, you know, I get to a space where it's hard to describe and you seem to, I feel like when you're talking, I'm reading out of like a Louis L'Amour book and I'm like, oh my God, just, <laughs> just keep going. Just tell me more about the stream and about cooking out of the tin can. And like, I mean, that's, that's the spice of life. That's the stuff that we all, I think as, as kids, we, we, we want those experiences. And has, has that always been something that has been a part of kind of your skill set is the ability to sort of articulate these experiences or is that kind of a, a uh, newer <laughs> later in life thing. Uh, yeah, probably I'm 59 now. So I've been at this racket, uh, <laughs> trying to make a living at climbing since 87, when I got $400 from the American Alpine club and a, a mountain jacket from the North face. And so I was like, Oh, there it is. But so I've become better at, at um, talking about it, but all of the formative experiences I had in the backcountry were with our family. And so four kids and two parents. And so six of us traipsing around in, in the backcountry. And my father would bring a book along and my mother would, you know, they'd each have a book and they would read from them. And they would always, um, these, these great moments. And for someone that from there, John Muir was a very real figure. I mean, it was someone of my great grandparents or my grandfather, my father's grandfather's um, peer and cohort. And my grandfather, he worked his whole career for Hetch Hetchy Water and Power. And that was his, um, that was his, he was a lineman and worked between early intake and the priest reservoir. So that was, so there was all very much something that was connected to us. And, um, but yeah, if we could encourage, uh, Children, it, I, I, not that I'm an educator, but perhaps the best thing we can do with children in kindergarten, first grade is, one, introduce them to a second language so they're just like understand bilingualism and that you're not the only person on this planet. And then outdoor backcountry skills. And uh, when I talk to my friends in Norway, they're like, oh, yeah, this is the the second graders camping trip that came out to an ice structure when I was there last February. And these are, they're like clawing their way up an ice structure and they're like oh yeah it's the second grade exercise class <laughs> that was it was pretty cool so um and i think the the earlier we can teach children music a second language and appreciation for the outdoors those three ingredients really have helped balance my life and um it's also the life that jenny and i have shared with max sam and isaac so kind of one of the things that really resonated is this this ability that you had to identify your love for nature at a young age and then maintain that as your North star as you've navigated this attempt to be a professional climber. And so I, I think for people listening, right? Like we all can probably think back to that time when we were young and we had that thing we were obsessed with, like with the moment where you're crossing the stream, smelling the pine and you had that, that, that clarifying realization that this is it. Like I need this in my life. Have you lost that at times and had to go back and find it? Like, have you had to navigate raising a family, building a career, just the tug and the push and pull of life and said, I'm not doing enough of that creek crossing pine tree in the summer sun. I need to get back there. Like, how have you balanced that? Because I know we can get lost, right? It's easy to get pulled off track and you're doing something you don't want to be doing so much. Yeah. As a percentage of my life, when I was in my 30s, nine months of the year, I was on expedition. Himalayas, Alaska, um, trips to Antarctica, climbing in Patagonia. So it was I was on the road climbing. And obviously, once becoming a family man and raising a family, there's less time that was being out there. But that same quality of being in nature and listening to the creek is still 
super meaningful. And it, so as I progress, um, Thursday afternoon, I'll be able to get out and go climbing and I'll cross a creek and I'm just anticipating the smell of the, the warm pine trees on a, on a summer afternoon in Southwest Montana. And those, those moments, they're sort of, um, if you see your soul as a sponge and society just squeezes everything out and you're just, ah, you're, you're stressed, you're overtaxed, you're overburdened. And then you go into the backcountry and it just fills you up. And that to me is, um, and I don't need as much as I did when I was younger. So I can, if I'm in New York City, I can escape for a walk in Central Park and I can, look at the trees and I can unfocus on the steel concrete glass world that that surrounds us that we need to live that that this respite from civilization that I find in nature is inherently soothing and comforting to my well-being and by extension that of other people that was really beautifully said I mean I was like <laughs> almost got emotional when you're saying that I do do you go somewhere mentally when you're when you're trying to soak up kind of that that feeling that experience do you i mean and what i mean by that is like do you are you much of like a kind of replayer of of past experiences memories is there a beautiful place you're like you're like oh man i just got done doing a keynote presentation in new york and i'm walking past people and i'm gonna go into central park and does your mind drift to like a high up on a wall and you know in alaska or or are you kind of more like I'm here in the present moment? Like this is like I'm just how how do you process that? Because for me, it's usually a bit of an escape. I'll kind of think about a, a memory and try to try to plant my feet there for a second. Yeah, there um, the memory is wonderful with us, and they can. If I'm in a, a tough situation or it's things are stressful, I can be oh I'm gonna think back to this time that I sat on the edge of a, a little marsh, so to say, with um, a, a brook babbling through it and just be calm with it and, and to do that. And sort of in the same way that the story of Ernest Shackleton and 17 months at sea and everything went along, I keep that story close to my pocket because it's like, oh, I missed my flight. Well, okay, Shackleton lived for 17 months on seal blubber. <laughs> um, I don't have connectivity on my cell phone. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Think about other people that have been Lewis and Clark, or you know, countless other expeditions that where there was a a great de degree of hardship, and you keep that what they're able to do as a motivator, and then by extension, thinking about good, natural, healthy places that we go to. And there's a little campsite that I visit in Highlight Canyon that it's well off the beaten path. It's two thousand feet up the side of a scrambly cliff and it's just a little tent platform and going there physically once every other year or something like that is a real treat but I can also in my mind's eye I can move it there so we've all these really wonderful natural places that give us a spirit of you know that we're alive and we're in a good place but the other places that are like the most challenging place I find is uh, the pickup zone at airports because you're always on the lower level. There's cars, there's tons of exhaust, there's all these smoking stations. It's just like, it's frantic. People want to get out of there. They drop you off and it's all scenic and everything, but the pickup is always like, it's just like, how do I, what do I, what do, I do here? What am I doing? This is like humanity that creates a fair degree of like uncertainty. But then you escape and you're, you can... If you are busy, you can conjure up ideas and places you've been and have that moment of peace come to you. More after the break. Stay with us. What is the two week philosophy? I, I, I feel like this is, um, we're getting a little in, inside Intel. I love this. Oh, <laughs> well, we have 12 months in the year. So a total of 52 weeks. And then I look at within 14 days, um, you can do quite a bit. I turned 60 in November and I figure, okay, I've got another 20 years of being really active till I get to age 80. And so within that, there's certain 
areas and places and things that um, I like to do, seeing as we're at my desk. The, this is like old school, like paper that writes down. I write stuff down, but in here <laughs> I've got like, here's the uh, the two week calendar. <laughs> so like, what can you do in two weeks? And yeah, the fourth two week window of 2022, I was in Norway ice climbing and it was it was just this, so that I've been able to say, okay, I'm going to budget two weeks, I'm going to do it. And then I have the double two weeks, which is the month I'll be spending in Nepal. Um, and I've kind of three weeks, I'll be in business of three and a half days to travel on either end of that. So I'll have three weeks of, of being in, in the wilderness. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, within that, I look at these various two week windows where I live here in Southwest Montana. And so after living here for 20 years, I'll be like, oh, okay, the first week of October to the, the first week of November, that two-week window is when we, the first time we get snow in town. That second two-week window in November is climbable ice. That second two-week window in March is when the snow leaves the front yard. Um, the first two-week window of June is when the, the water peaks, um, the last two weeks of May or when the lilacs bloom. And so all these connections that are tied to uh, things I do. And it, it's given me a sense of purpose and direction and a way to identify what I want to do with them. Are you an eternal optimist? Is that kind of the perspective that you've, that you've taken? And or, <laughs> and, or I mean, I, I think it's obvious that your very glasses half full, but like how... How have you been able to kind of process some of these maybe harder things to witness and then, but then keep the positive mentality? Because as, as much as I think your message, you, you speak on climate change quite, quite vocally and you advocate, but, but then the message is never doom and gloom. The message seems to always be one of positivity and, and I don't know, getting people out there to experience it, which, which I really love as, as a parent, I guess. Yeah. Well, all three of us are optimists. I mean, we all... Yeah. Within five minutes of meeting each other, we're like, oh, yeah, we're cut from the same cloth and our wavelength is the same. So we see the world the same way. And so there's um, there's uh, there, it's always good to find people that that share that. What a wonderful life that we are living in that opportunity to be with that. So there's um, yeah. And having experienced um, on a personal level hardship and loss, um, alpine climbing and climbing in general is a very dangerous pursuit. And I don't let anyone tell you that it isn't. Um, that's it, because it is very dangerous. And but the other side of it is it provides these moments of elation, these moments of self discovery, these moments of really connecting with the people you're with because your life is dependent upon their trust in you. So we're not creating a, a tennis match where you and I would play against each other and one of us wins, now the other was. And I love tennis and I love team sports and things like that, but it doesn't give me that same sense of fulfillment as a human as, say, if I go climbing, I get three body lengths above the ground, all of a sudden I have to start processing because if I make a mistake, I can injure myself and I can possibly die. And that level of that seriousness, we don't get it in many different activities and pursuits. And I'm not saying it's there for everyone, but for me, that, that putting yourself in a slightly uncomfortable place, that brings out the best in human potential. And so that knowing that hardship is going to bring us out our, our own best potential is is really key with it. And then to keep layering on that is optimism. And the other point, Chris, that you touched about on was um, the disparity of, of where we are in this world. So the three of us are, are white males. I mean, the world, we've, the world was designed by us. It's, it's fixed by us. We're trying to unleverage that, the three of us, because we're progressive. We want more for humanity, but there's plenty of people that are out there just trying to leverage it for more of their own good and doing it for in, in less than truthful ways. But if you do go through suffering by your own volition, 
And no one's asking us to go climb mountains. No one's asking us to ride a bicycle around Iceland in the winter. Right? No one's asking us to spend two weeks in a blind studying a thrush or something like that. I mean, there's something that goes that, that there's, there's hardship that comes with that. And whereas if you're a firefighter or a police person, you're taking on risk for the greater good. And so society rewards them with adulation and hero status and, and there's a lot that goes in. But when you take on risk for your own self-actualization and not necessarily pleasure, but you're taking on risk to to see what you what you are, that there's less of a societal acceptance of that, particularly here in the United States. So you're like, oh, you're foolish, you're selfish. There's nothing that coming with that. But if you go through that, then you can understand for people that are less fortunate. So the 4 billion people on this planet that are, that don't have a comfortable level of, of living and, and that understanding that and, and talking about it and, and being present with it is, is in many ways, the first step to, to doing the right thing. One, one thought to that in, in terms of compliment you, Conrad, I think something you do so well is, I would say a calm way of communicating about our planet. And you talk about this uh, constant perennial bombardment with data, right? Information that you responded to as a young person. I feel that way about the environment, right? There's so many little alarm bells going off that my eyes are trained to see. And so my question for you is how do you find time to rest and recharge? Because you can't always just be responding and reacting, right? And you have to have some sort of a, of a playbook on how to absorb those those cues from the environment, whether you're climbing or whether you're advocating or whether you're on a big bike ride or in Iceland, right? Like you have to figure out a way to shut down, lower the RPMs and make a plan. How do you do that with say the climate or a crazy expedition where there's so much on the line? Ooh, good question. And it's, it's a new question. So I, I, I'll um, probably with climate and where we're at uh, in social issues and, and where this planet is, is I'm trying to think what it's going to be like in 200 years. So seven generations down the line, about the age of the United States. It was 1776 was the, the Declaration of Independence and we, the Bicentennial. I was a 14-year-old boy, so it was... I, but then I was like, what was it like 200 years ago? What's it going to be like in 200 years? So knowing that what I do today is going to have impact for future generations is it's a source of motivation and it's also a sense of duty and so I'm still not <laughs> answering your question about what I do to to recharge um, the ver yeah um, going for a run going for a walk um, spending time uh, with people that are you're really close to and not necessarily having to have an in-depth conversation just being in their presence and just and being there but um i just have a surfeit of energy i wake up and i'm like oh it's like we've got it today <laughs> something good is going to happen today let's see where the day takes us and what and there's that optimism that uh, is that uh, optimism recharges my ability to communicate about these really pertinent issues. So Conrad, as, as a, I feel like a, one, it's really interesting to see somebody kind of evolve from um, such a, I guess, a, I don't know how to say this, like a solo act in terms of in the beginning, obviously you always needed climbing partners. You know, that's a, that's a critical part of climbing is having partners, but it seems more in the last 10 years, 15 years, like you really enjoy this sort of expedition lead or kind of um, uh, like you like bringing people together for the more cumulative experience as opposed to the more solo experience or, you know, you just you and your partner. Um, and and I, I just would love to know, like, what was that transition? Like, was that a was that a forced transition? Was that something that you just kind of naturally came about? Because obviously, you know, in the beginning, you know, you got to go fast and light. You really can't bring a, a large group, but it seems like in the last um, couple of years, it's more, it's almost become more about like 
sharing this experience with people, which is, which is just an observation. Um, love to just kind of get your thoughts on that. And if that's something maybe you've witnessed. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, Probably the the turnaround on that was October fifth, nineteen ninety nine. That was when David Bridges and Alex and I, Lowe and I were on Shisha Pongma. The avalanche took both of those uh, David and Alex's lives, and I kind of was like, "Wow, I'd been living a pretty self centered life up until that point, but I had to um, be there for other people." And I think that when you experience non sequential death, so yeah, our grandparents die before our parents die, and, and we understand that. They teach us that in school. But when you have someone that's young, that's that loses their life, whether it's through recreation or through violence, through war, through conflict, it leaves, it's pretty heavy on the person. And so I was supremely motivated by what I get from nature and to be able to give that to other people to not to not to proselytize or anything like that, but just to be, here's the good tidings. Look what we can benefit from being out here. And now where I am at in age, it um, it's kind of my, it's, it's my responsibility to, to help out, to mentor people, to make introductions, to, take down the fence, open the gate, make the outdoors welcoming and accessible for all people. And part of that, the foundation of that is I kind of see life in these chapters or quartiles or different ways. And it doesn't have to be set five years, 10 years, 15 years, but there's four segments in life. And that first segment, say up into age 20 or whenever, let's use 20 as our arbitrary cutoff point here, you're under your parents' wing. They nurture you, they feed you, they educate you, they kind of set the rudder on your ship that you're going to go sail. That second window in life is you kind of discover what you're going to go do. And then that third window, you become the very best at being what you've done. And you're, both of you are squarely in that that third phase where you're excelling at photography and, and nature and appreciation and giving something back to the planet. And then that fourth phase, which I'm squarely in right now, is that I'm giving back my experience to people in that first, second, perhaps into that third phase of their life where they can then use that experience. And that's the beauty of humanity, that we have a collective wisdom and we wouldn't be where we are today with the skills that we have if if people prior to us hadn't taken time to reach out to us, to nurture us, to mentor us, and to help us along. And the more that we can identify that and see value in it and and make it an active practice in our life, the that's so being in that fourth phase where I want to help people out and, and introduce people to the mountains, that's like that's the coolest that's the coolest way to be joy seems to be this perennial thread that that really uh i would say defines your kind of approach to life how, how have you prioritized it and do you think society at large prioritizes it enough yeah good question there's a ted talk from a harvard professor that i'm just going to circle around to this so several years back now um about synthesizing happiness that you just can't. Oh, happiness is going to show up in like a, an envelope in the in the in the mailbox. But rather, you have to actively find things that make you happy, and then not synthesize like in making fake music or plastic or something like that. But you have to create that that sense of happiness within your own being, and that you can um, that you can do that. And they had a variety of different studies that they that were um, that showed people that were. They were able to find happiness even after tragedy, being in a car accident or something like that. And they're like, well, yeah, it could be worse. I could be dead. And some people that have everything, they're still not happy. Um, and with that, so there's, there's, um, life is incredibly short, especially when we understand cosmic time, geologic time, plant time. Um, it's incredibly long. We compare it to insect time, but. It's all relative, but we only have this one precious life. So what are we going to do with it? And it, if 
to find happy people and to, to share happiness and to be motivated. That's, that's like, that's there. That's the foundation of it, <laughs> I guess. So, and people that are pessimists and, and they're just there. I'm like, nice to meet you, but you just gravitate. You find people, you bring them into your orbit that share the same joy. You mentioned uh, Memphis Rocks, and I, I just wanted to kind of get a, a thought on this. This is one of the places you've been pouring a lot of your energy into um, to kind of create, you know, as Charles said, create more bridges, less walls within the climbing community specifically. I'd love to just kind of get a, I don't know much about it, totally, to be honest, um, only just seen it a little bit in kind of some films and whatnot, but love to get your perspective on that and what that's been like. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And um, thanks to uh, the Memphis Rocks community for em- embracing me and giving me the opportunity to be part of the program. Um it was founded by Tom Shadyac, who is a um, film director, producer, and made classics such as... Uh, liar, uh, Liar. <laughs> liar, Liar, Nutty Professor. I mean, it's just the great comedy films that, that we all know of, and a, a wonderful person. And he was able to purchase a redevelopment uh, program that didn't work. And so they federal money had gone in to build supermarkets and, and all this, but none of the big chains. And so he bought it on auction... First step was to put a state-of-the-art climbing gym in there because he saw, Tom saw the value that in the way that humans interact with other humans and that we communicate and that we build trust, that you're struggling with gravity, the three body length rule, all these things kind of fit into it really well. And so Tom was like, hey, we're going to do this. And so it's this wonderful program. It's a nonprofit Um it's pay what you can, so you can walk in there and not pay. You can also pay a standard gym pass that you would buy at any commercially operated gym. But it's also become a community center for this neighborhood, South Memphis, the 38106 area code, which um, cut off by the interstate and a railroad track is uh, does not have the... Um, the things that we take for granted. And so this climbing gym being in there has been a great, um, a force of good. And so there's a lot of people that are employed there. There's uh, young people that climb there. They, um, it's, a, it's a community center more than simply a climbing gym. They've got um, a, a kitchen in there that serves up healthy food. There's pantries that are stocked to provide um Healthcare items uh, for people. Um, there's a maternity assistance program there for uh, young women, and hopefully, in in time, that this area, that the gym, there's some additional buildings there, becomes sort of a a job opportunity building sort of place. So. Finding, building out the machine shop and the carpentry shop and having one of the big construction services company come in and say, yeah, we believe in this. Here's $2 million. This is a gentle ask out there for all of you at Home Depot and Lowe's and other places. But it, to come in there and, and, and train people in woodworking and um, train people in computer programming, train people in the visual arts, uh, film and TV. And, and so it's, um, yeah, the Memphis rocks has given me much more than I've given Memphis rocks. And on Sunday morning, I leave to go to Tahoma, otherwise known as Mount Rainier. And we're going to Andreas Marine and I, and some friends, and we're the six youngsters from the, uh, uh, Memphis area we're going to climb Mount Rainier and it's going to be a huge challenge for all of us and it's like so um, but again coming back to earlier in our conversations we don't grow as humans unless we experience a little bit of discomfort and a little bit of like what are we really made of what can we really do and for both myself as a guide and for um, the the people that are coming um, that that, that will be with us. It's going to be a, we're going to have a great time. There's going to be blisters and tears and sunburned and, but there's going to be more laughter. And if we're lucky, if 
we're really lucky and the weather cooperates, we might just get a summit. But mm. that makes it all the more special if you know that it isn't, it, it isn't taken for granted. So anyways, a little bit of a, about Memphis rocks. So. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting point you just, you just ended on. Can you, do you mind just kind of pin rolling that out for me a little more, bit more? If, if you don't take the summit for granted, it becomes a bit sweeter. I mean, what, what, is, what, is that, what do you mean by that? Just, just in life in general um and or where, where does that that thought come from when you leave on an expedition to climb a mountain you're like well we're going to go to the summit of the mountain that's our goal is to make it there that's that's the drive but the process of getting there is really where the learning happens and the reason we go climbing is to challenge ourselves and to get to the top of that mountain but if we take it for granted then it's sort of like oh like is it really that meaningful yeah I can go to um, Baldy Peak. Every mountain valley in the west has a Baldy and a Twin Peaks, and, <laughs> and not the most original. But I could climb up, hike up Baldy today, and I would. I could leave home being arrogant, like, oh, it's only going to take me ninety minutes to tr- trot up the trail, and I get to the top. But if I go there, like, yeah, it could be. I could get a swarm of hornets. I could sprain my ankle. An afternoon thunderstorm could come in. I think about these eventualities that the summit's not taken for granted. But then when you do make it there, it becomes a little bit more special. So um, perhaps to put it in a material sense, think about like if you knew what was inside that Christmas gift before you opened it up, it wouldn't be special. So it's that, that anticipation of the unknown that, um, that brings something about us. And then taking it from material things to rather um, experiential, where you go into the mountain or you share time with people. So one of the things you said there that really resonates is an expedition has so many parts, right? There's so many kind of seasons in an expedition. And I, and I would imagine that you have to be comfortable with those, the change of seasons, the the change of one experience to the next, you know, you're at base camp and then you're moving up in this kind of march, going through these chapters of this long adventure. Has this mindset of being open and, and embracing seasons given you an ability to really navigate these chapters of your of your life from a you know peak bagger with one partner to a family man and a father to having to you know transition to maybe an expedition leader to now in this fourth phase did expeditions kind of prime you for those evolutions in your life yeah great question so if we look at the experience of being outdoors and i see it as a there's a full circle of it and so it starts with the ideation so it'd be like charles you and i are going to go walk across the swan valley in montana in winter so we have this idea and then we start planning and we look at the maps and then we we sort out the equipment we get our gear ready and then we actually go do it and we experience the hardship when we come back and whether we make it to the summit or not or we see a wolf or we see something that is really special that's all part of it and then there's the moment you get back home and you open the gate and you put your pack down and you clean your equipment out and then you you recollect do you think about those ideas that you've had that sort of that recognition so it's not just about going there and tackling the mountain and conquering the summit, something like that. It's this full circle of, of human emotion that goes into it and that, that makes it special. And for me, that was a big part of it. it was like, well, you got to be prepared. You got to get your backpack ready. You're going to go out for two weeks. We're going to be self-sufficient. And what do you really need? And, and how are you going to, um, you know, that instilling that at a young age and realizing that the whole of the experience includes things other than just making it to the top of the mountain. And so the whole of the experience of life isn't just being the best at what you can do, but it means learning about it, identifying it, becoming the best you can, and then circling back and using that knowledge to to help the next generation see the world in the same way that you do. Do you have uh, any advice on that that you could maybe share with our listeners who are just trying to get a little bit of that Conrad wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Yeah, we approach what we do with a pure state of mind. And as you mentioned, Charles, a calm state of mind, and, and we make good decisions. It's a great observation with that. But we have um, this wild, crazy social experiment that sort of started in 2007, and that's um, social media. And it, we don't understand it. I mean, you watch Social Dilemma, great film, you can kind of get what's going on there. But I think for many of the, um, you know, are you taking a photograph to share an idealized story of your life on social media? So someone get a glimpse of it, or are you presenting a real thing and, and how that, how that interacts with us? We really don't know. And it's, it's all alarmingly new. We know that it, there's sort of a, a dopamine release when we get likes on our photographs or if people comment on it or, um, it's just it's it's and I think that's changed how people see what they contribute to the w- what's going on and that if we can take a step back and think long term, I mean life isn't a sixty second TikTok thing or the other, and it's not watching repeated ones of those all day long. It's about going out and okay, I've got to water the flowers today. I've got to make sure the dogs are fed ultra humbling. I've got to pick up after the dogs. <laughs> you know? Why can't they do it on themselves? You know, we're like, we have chickens. And so it'd be great if like the dogs could feed the chickens and the dogs picked up after themselves. But no, we have to care for them. They're under our care. And there's something that um, that the ability to care and to give to other people is one of the most wonderful things that we can do. So for me personally, being able to help someone out whether it's, hey, you need help changing the flat on the side of the road, I'm here to help, or I'm giving something back. That giving to someone makes me happy. And we see it with prison populations where they've done study that that the prisoners that have a a chance to tend a garden and to give something to, to the earth and to create something in return, they're doing well rather than, I mean, they're in a in a very inhospitable place, cinder block and steel and glass and security and everything like that, but giving them the opportunity to give back and say, so I guess in a roundabout way, giving is more important than receiving in my view of, of, of how I am. If I can, and it, if I give to someone my knowledge, my experience, the contacts they have, if I introduce uh, underserved black community from Memphis to the mountains and to share the same joy that I have, that brings me deep satisfaction and deep happiness. And, um, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that wisdom, Conrad. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> I would, yeah, if I could put a few more quarters into the machine and get another hour with you, I would, but, uh, maybe we'll, we'll have to get another catch up here soon. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cheers, buddy. Was that everything you expected? Because for me, that was like everything I expected and more. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing that comes to mind with Conrad is they say, like, don't meet your heroes, but you got to meet them because mm-hmm. they're epic. I think for me, what always is so inspiring is his ability to distill optimism into so like into life yeah. in so many different facets, you know? You know, I know so many athletes, I guess you could say. Like that's such a, a terrible word to use when describing Conrad. But when I think of like athletes, I'm like, oh yeah, the guy's like a, you know, he's one of the best so-and-sos in the world or whatever. Conrad eclipses all that, you know, and just and just moves into this space of being such a a poetic, well spoken, articulate, like self-actualized, you know, uh, uh, human being. I think, I think that's such a great point that he's done all these things, these, these feats in athleticism, these accolades that, you know, you, you would see in an outdoor store, but really what stands out for us is just, he is an ex- exemplary human and it's mm-hmm. hard to be, a, it's hard to be a good human and he does it so well him him discussing like you know his his idea of the two weeks like mm. you know you're given these two weeks like that was so beautiful and he had this one line about like being a sponge and how you kind of absorb you sort of go out into the world and you're like a sponge being squeezed and you just you know everything in you sort of permeates out and then all of a sudden you go into nature and just absorbs it i was like 
almost in yeah. tears. It was such a such a cool phrase. And and the way that he articulated it was just, it was so well done. And, you know, there's people who you hear speak and you're like, well, maybe they're reiterating something they heard from a book. And then you're hearing people speak and they're like, that person is speaking purely from experience. Totally. And I, I think one of the things too, that was really striking is that it's really easy to try to fight change, to fight the, mm. the, the march of the clock, but his yeah. embrace of phonology of that seasonal pattern, that seasonal cycle to me was yeah. just so illustrative of that wisdom because he's like, Hey, yeah. life's chapters, life's seasons, let's just embrace and mm. roll with it. Just like an expedition. Yeah. Right. And there was almost like no angst about like, yeah, you know, I'm not in my twenties, you know, going out to the farthest, farthest, taking the hugest risks. Like he, he's managed in my mind to age like incredibly gracefully. And it's a, it's a pleasure to watch. And it's, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, I feel like privileged just to be able to kind of absorb a little bit of that and, you know, take a sip of that fine wine, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, totally. But, yeah. It's pretty, yeah. And I mean, pretty rad. And for somebody who has done so much in the outdoors, we didn't talk about any of those things. We didn't no. talk about the first ascents no. or the deepest trip, you know, the no. gnarliest expedition, right? Yeah. You and don't so, really need to, you know, all that's, all that's out there. I think, I think it's so cool to hear about his upbringing in Yosemite yeah. as a kid, like when he was like basically portraying his like almost, uh, you know, prairie upbringing, you know, it was like, yeah, we'd like, you know, bring the animals out to the back country. And we're, yeah. I was like, this is, this is just too quintessential. Like, of course you are who you are. Like, look at the upbringing, you know? And I, I love that. That was, that was really special. I feel like, uh, just to kind of understand that you know you get a sense of who he is as a person a little more absolutely yeah and i think there's so much to be said for growing up in an incredible epic place that wasn't incredible and epic on the map at the time mm. right you're just totally. shaped by this mm. cathedral but not yeah. thinking of it in that way it's this is just the backyard yeah. totally. so some, yeah, something special. Well, that was a rad one man I'm, I'm grateful that we got to uh have him on early and and thanks for uh hosting it. that was that was a mind blower. Yeah. I'm stoked. The Traverse is a Huckberry production in collaboration with Chris Burkard, Charles Post, and Duct Tape, then Beer. From Huckberry, Andy Forch, Richard Greiner, and Ben O'Mara are executive producers. Mike Idell and John Desabry are senior producers. Matt Marr, Benjamin Rawls, Aaron Para, and Willis Smith provided additional production help. From Duct Tape, then Beer, Becca Cahal and Fitz Cahal are executive producers. Evan Phillips is the senior producer. Music by Greg Jong and Graham Barton. Until next time, see you out there.